Endowment and the River Campus Libraries. As I said, we welcome Anthony Giardini um, as our speaker. Um, we're excited about it in and of itself, but we also are excited because we actually collect uh, Mr. Giardina's uh, papers, his drafts, his proofs, his correspondence, amongst other things. And there's a display at the back, and I'm sure that you've um, noticed that on the way in. So do take a, an opportunity at the end to take a look. Mr. Diagina will be um, introduced by Assistant Professor of English, Stephen Schottenfeld. Uh, Professor Schottenfeld has a BA from the University of Michigan, um, an MA from Johns Hopkins, and an MFA from Ohio, uh, the University of Ohio. He joined the University of Rochester in 2008 and teaches creative writing, modern and contemporary literature, fiction writing, playwriting, and screen screenwriting. His stories have been published in the Gettysburg Review, Tri-Quarterly, Story Quarterly, Virginia Quarterly Review, and, and many other literary magazines. And his writings have garnered um, a Michener Copernicus Society of America grant and special mentions in the Pushcart Prize and Best American Short Stories and Anthologies. He's published a story collection, Miss Ellen Jameson is Not Deceased, and is currently working on a novel, The Elephant Ring, uh, set in Memphis. Before um, we turn to um, Stephen, a few housekeeping items. Anthony Giardina's books are available for purchase at the table at the back of the room, and Mr. Giardina will um, do an unauthor signing, if you wish, um, at the end of the um, talk. And please mark your calendars for the next uh, Neely lecture, which will be on Wednesday, April 10th. Our guest speaker will be Joseph Sassoon, who will be talking about politics in Iraq. And if you'd like to be on our mailing list for other uh, Neely series and, and uh, future years as, as well, um, it's a truly wonderful enrichment to our campus and to the community. There is a sign-up sheet at the back. So without further ado, Professor Schottenfeld. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Anthony Giardina. Anthony is the author of five novels, including Recent History, White Guys, and Norumbega Park, a story collection entitled The Country of Marriage, and numerous plays. His short fiction and essays have appeared in Harper's, Esquire, GQ, New York Times Magazine. His plays have been produced in New York at Playwrights Horizon and the Manhattan Theatre Club, and regionally at Arena Stage in Washington, D.C., Seattle Rep., Yale Rep., The Long Wharf in New Haven, and the Cleveland Playhouse. He has taught at Smith and Mount Holyoke College, Colorado College, the University of Rochester, and in the MFA program at the University of Massachusetts. He is a regular visiting professor at the Mitchner Center of the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, there's a scene in Giardina's 2006 novel, White Guys, which poignantly illustrates the complexities of class ascension, a central theme of not only this novel, but also of Norumbega Park and recent history. The narrator, Tim O'Kane, has joined his childhood friend, Billy Magavero, at Billy's recently purchased house, a house in Waltham, a step up from their hard scrabble beginnings in the town of Winship. Billy is proudly showing Tim and another friend, Freddie, the long backyard where he plans to cut down the trees to make a straightaway for the inevitable baseball catches with his child. The child isn't born yet, but Billy has mapped out the land and a future. Except the trees are fruit trees, Freddie notes. Billy hasn't seen this as it's late March, and the trees, in Giardina's words, hadn't yet started to bud or establish a clear identity, end quote. And now he's unsure of his intent, alter the land or himself. Tim says, once after I'd thrown the ball back to him, Billy held it in his hand and looked at me for a moment in one of those instances of hiddenness he was so good at he reached up and pulled down one of the branches of the tree above him, and the petals fell. He picked one up and sniffed it. Good, huh? I asked. He didn't answer me. His look 
turned quizzical, even a little resistant. Billy's resistance is striking, given that he strides through much of the book with such unchecked force. He covets this new place, feels its allure, and yet it displaces him. He loves it, but he's lost there. The branches rising above him, Billy is quite simply in over his head. If the trees have not established a clear identity, one can never say the same thing about Giardina's characters. He renders their identities clearly and completely in all of their dreams and aspirations. And one of the great pleasures of reading Giardina's novels occur in moments when his strong-willed characters waver and shift. Billy's hiddenness is a trait that Giardina detects in everyone, even the most steadfast of actors. A cool seductress suddenly turns vulnerable and frightened, or conversely, a man under the duress of a police investigation finds an unforeseen confidence. The author inhabits all of these people in every nuance and dimension. He reveals the depths of their feelings, summons forth their words. Giardina's dialogue is pitch perfect, evidence of his playwright's ear. His character's voices bristle with energy and direct. In another scene from White Guys, Billy and Tim are at a restaurant and Billy scrutinizes the pictures on the walls, pictures of, in Billy's words, old dead guys. He sees much to admire and he pays homage. What did they want? They wanted power, right? They wanted, he moved his hands so his outstretched fingers were touching one another, to build, you know? And they lived in this imperfect world, but that was all right. They understood the imperfections. They accepted them. They had mistresses. They had houses that were normal houses. They went to church and they sinned and big fucking deal. And now, what have we got? We're not half the men they were, and we think we're so good. We make our kids wear seat belts and everything's, you know, for the kids. But we're not good. We're the greediest people on the face of the earth. Us. All us good guys. We're so greedy, we make these guys on the wall look like altar boys. You know why? Because they wanted power. Power. We want affection. The significance of this passage is signaled not only in the impassioned dissection of upward mobility and generational change in the indictment of smug domestication, but also in Giardino's arrangements and expressions on the page. The words are blunt, and Giardino emphasizes the bluntness by punching out various words in italics, seatbelts and kids and good and us and power. But when he arrives at the final word, perfection, he lifts the italics and draws an alliterative connection to and contrast with the word power. The word perfection stands upright and proper in its alignment, but it's missing some of the distinctive slant of the previous words, which possess an imperfect but energetic stance. Giardina understands his characters, how they speak and yearn, and he knows their land. And these two geographies, internal and external, are intertwined, the boundaries and meanings of one body transforming the other. He tracks a town's, a character's rise and decline and makeovers. He is a thrilling guide, driving us around the Boston city and suburbs, exploring its streets and observing its inhabitants. And tonight he'll take us elsewhere to the Civil War and into his next project, and we're delighted to have him back in Rochester to detail his next journey. Please welcome Anthony Giardino. I could listen to that all night. Now, I've been told I'm really loud. So if I turn this on and it's too loud, is this too loud? OK, so that, how's that? That's, can I do just one? Yeah, you can use the one on the podium. On the podium, and I can turn this off. Oh, boy, because that's really loud. Anyway. Thank you, Stephen. That was, that was beautiful, beautiful. Um, and I want to thank Andrea for inviting me here tonight, making this possible, and my beloved Phyllis Andrews for archiving my papers here and giving me a continuing life at Rochester. Uh, I used to think that the words, my British publisher, were the most beautiful words in the English language. And then I got a British publisher, and you know, you get used to these things, but now I think my archived papers are the most beautiful 
three words in the English language. So thank you. So I'm going to begin this talk on the novelist and the historical imagination by telling a story about writing, or, or rather reading, because uh, all writing, I think, comes out of reading. A dozen or so years ago, I was reading purely for my own pleasure an 800-page book of criticism by Edmund Wilson called Patriotic Gore. Patriotic Gore is a massive study of all the contemporary writing of the Civil War. Wilson read everything from Harriet Beecher Stowe to the journals of Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, the poetry of Whitman and Melville, obscure novels by John W. DeForest and Albion W. Everybody seems to be named W. who was writing about the Civil War, Tourget, uh, as well as Sherman's memoirs, Grant's autobiography. But what really struck me in my reading of this book by Edmund Wilson was his citing and his description of a poem by Herman Melville called The Scout Toward Aldi, a poem that I hadn't until then ever heard of. The Scout Toward Aldi is one of what Melville called his battle pieces. It seems to have come out of a visit he made in 1864 to a cousin of his who was camped with the Army of the Potomac. Now I think about uh, the fact that a poem like that exists, a poem about the Civil War by a non-combatant. I would not, as a writer in 2013, ever dare to write a novel about either of our most recent engagements in Afghanistan or Iraq. I feel like those stories belong to those who have fought. But that's never been true about the Civil War. Uh, the war bled imaginatively well beyond its battle lines, and it continues to bleed. There were two movies nominated for Academy Awards this year, Django Unchained and, of course, Lincoln, with Civil War subjects. The Civil War long ago ceased to belong to those who fought it, and in a way, maybe never did. Which brings me back to Melville. The subject of The Scout Toward Aldi, the poem that so incited my imagination a dozen years ago, was a partisan Confederate soldier named John Mosby. Before the Civil War, Mosby was already a pretty colorful character. He'd been th uh, thrown out of the University of Virginia allegedly for shooting another student. But he went on, got a law degree, married, uh, had a family, and then joined the regular uh, Confederate Army. He didn't want to, and he didn't believe, in fact, in the secessionist cause. But he was loyal to his native state, Virginia, and he thought, well, whatever Virginia does, I'm going to do. So he became, uh, a, I think he was a captain in the regular army. But his glory and his legend started when he became a partisan. And he took a group of men, variously numbered either a dozen to hundreds, and took to the Virginia woods in the band around the Capitol, which is now roughly Route 50. It's still called John Mosby Highway. They're still very proud of John Mosby down there. His goal was just to threaten the Capitol with these partisan raids. And he would capture men. He would capture horses. And they were constantly sending out bands um, to try to, scouts actually, to try to capture him. And they never did. What Melville saw, as maybe only Melville could, was that Mosby was, in fact, a kind of postmodern figure. In the game of war, he played by no known rules. He deconstructed the war. He took it apart. He made it a kind of game. He was a magus figure, a trickster, a master of disguise, what Edmund Wilson calls a mocking spirit. He was a force that served to confuse a white whale. What Melville does in The Scout Toward Aldi is set in opposition to this phantom figure, another man, a figure of the utmost transparency and rectitude, a young Union Army major, newly married, a man who wants to play by the rules, who believes wholeheartedly in them. He goes off in search of the elusive Mosby, and as happens in Moby Dick, he's destroyed by what he can't apprehend. It's not really a brilliant poem, I have to say. But as Edmund Wilson was quick to note, it's a brilliant idea for a poem, or for something. 
Wilson was careful to point out how all of Melville's big themes, as well as his small ticks, were there in the scout toward Aldi. The unknowability of the other, the homoeroticism implicit in men seeking other men. The Civil War belonged to Melville because it was a tabula rasa, a great communal blank slate on which everyone was free to write meaning. And to some degree, we're still writing meaning on the Civil War, though I think more self-consciously. What excited me a dozen years ago, reading Wilson, was that in describing Melville's poem, he was also pretty much describing a novel I was then writing, the novel Stephen just referred to, White Guys. White Guys was and is the story of two men, friends since childhood, one of whom, it turns out, may well be a murderer. <clears throat> It's a novel about the pursuit by a young man of rectitude, a young man who seeks to play by the rules, of another man, one who is a kind of trickster, who delights in upending things. I'm reducing the novel a little in describing it that way, but what I'm saying is in large part true. As a novelist, I am interested, and have always been, in the way men seek out incomplete parts of themselves in other men. And I'm interested in the homoeroticism frankly, implicit in that pursuit, the way that even stopping short of actual sex, men seek things in other men, often to the point of their own self-destruction. So I was already busy writing that novel when I came upon Wilson and Melville. But one of the things that happens when you're deep inside one novel is a part of your mind is always free to start thinking about what the next novel is going to be. And because so many ideas come along and present themselves, part of your work is to shoo them away, to say, go away, go away. I don't need you yet. I don't want you yet. And wait for the really good, the essential idea to arrive. That's pretty much what happened to me. I was briefly on fire with the idea of using Melville's plot, the stalwart Union soldier pursuing the ghostly trickster Mosby, for a Civil War novel of my own. But then I put the idea away. What did I know about the Civil War? I was and am a Massachusetts novelist. I know a little bit about families, especially Italian American families as they existed at the end of the 20th century. I know a little bit about class and sex, a little bit. That was my subject, stick with it. So I finished White Guys and I published it and then I wrote and published another novel, Norumbega Park, but guess what? Mosby and Melville refused to go away. They were waiting. And after finishing Norumbega Park, I felt strongly that I'd said about as much as I wanted to say for the time being anyway about the things I knew something about. It was time to know nothing. It was time to learn something new. But the Civil War, to be honest, I've always been a little resistant to the Civil War, or to be more precise, to the representations of it in my lifetime. I was 10 or 11 at the time of the war's centennial, and I remember being very excited about the little blue mock-ups of Union Army suits that they were hawking to little boys, and I begged my parents to buy me one, and of course they didn't. And then in middle school, I remember reading Bruce Catton's wonderfully romantic book about the last year of the war, A Stillness at Appomattox. My young, would-be novelist's imagination was stimulated by that title, I think. A stillness at Appomattox. Beautiful. But by the time of Ken Burns' Civil War documentary, I was pretty well turned off. So much so that whenever I heard Julie Harris's voice reading the diaries of Mary Chestnut, I got up and turned the TV off. Actually, I got up and slammed the TV off. There is something in us that says no to certain historical reenactments. Literally, no. Because we understand our ought to. The two very different sets of values are coming together to create an untruth. Julie Harris's voice is a beautiful, highly refined instrument keyed to soothe us, to draw us in, to make us identify with her. It's a voice that comes out of the actor's studio school of acting, all sensibility, all sensitivity. But what happens when you impose that sensibility on the words of a slaveholder's wife who kept a diary? Instead of looking hard and critically at Mary Chestnut as a cultured 19th century woman who managed to complain 
of, but ultimately overlook a lot of brutality and ugliness in order to keep her admittedly beautiful diary, we identify with her. She becomes Julie Harris, someone we believe we know. And in that transference, a false understanding occurs, and our thinking becomes mush. But if you're not willing to do that sort of imposition, what are you to do? Do you not touch the Civil War? Because to touch it with a set of values intrinsic to our own time is to falsify it? That was my dilemma. I suppose you have to falsify in some way if you're going to do historical fiction. And it's probably a good idea to give your reader somebody to identify with. But are there acceptable levels and unacceptable levels of doing that? And if so, what are they? It's interesting, to me anyway, that a few years before reading Edmund Wilson's book, I'd undergone, coincidentally, a little Wilsonian exercise of my own. In 1999, I wrote a piece for GQ, exploring the troubled feelings I'd had the year before encountering the simultaneous publication of Tom Brokaw's The Greatest Generation and Steven Spielberg's movie Saving Private Ryan. You can't have a glass, a, a sip of water anymore without citing Mario Rubio, Marco Rubio. Anyway. I hope I did that well. Both of those works had seemed deeply false to me. Brokaw's book had made the Second World War seem a more exalted and only slightly more dangerous version of the Boy Scouts, a heightened exercise in character building. Spielberg, after working hard and as far as I'm able to tell brilliantly at reenacting D-Day, retreated into what is perhaps the most sentimental version of soldiering I've seen in a movie since the 1940s. But what seemed dangerous to me in the fact of these two hugely popular works appearing simultaneously was that we'd been away from war for nearly 20 years in this country since the end of our adventure in Vietnam. At that time, a whole generation had grown up knowing little or nothing about actual war and as has been superbly documented by Paul Fussell about the eagerness with which young men joined uh, the army in Britain in World War I, distance from war creates romanticism about war. My prescience, which I give myself a lot of credit for, was in seeing that our ready willingness to accept the romanticism in Brokaw's and Spielberg's visions was priming us psychologically to fall too easily into another war and sure enough, we did. My own Wilsonian exercise was to go back and read as much as I could of the literature that had come out of World War II, written by actual veterans. In the course of this reading, I came upon a phrase in a book by the British military historian John Keegan, the rhetoric of history. What Keegan means by it is the way history becomes shaped over time in the retelling by the way it's already been told over and over again. So that events like war, for instance, seem to develop a specific shape, not because they really were that way, but because the official and popular histories have rendered them that way so many times. That phrase, the rhetoric of history, has been very much on my mind since I began researching the Civil War novel that I finally decided I had to write. The one borrowed from Melville and the scout toward Aldi. The one I finally couldn't avoid writing because the challenge came to seem so daunting. The first thing I determined to do in order to avoid falling into the trap posed by the rhetoric of history was to avoid accounts of the war written in the 20th century. Instead, to concentrate on those close to the bone older accounts that Edmund Wilson had laid out for me so generously in patriotic gore. What that means, of course, is I've done a lot of not looking, as the Civil War has been fought and refought most recently at the multiplex seven miles from my house. I have resisted seeing Spielberg's Lincoln, and I half suspect this is to my detriment. But every time I've watched the trailer for Lincoln and seen the battle scenes, the highly articulated smoke over the battlefield, I've been made to pause. Of course, this is accurate, as far as it goes. Of course, Spielberg has at his command a group of highly skilled researchers who know there was smoke on the battlefield. And he has further the great cinematographer Janusz Kaminski, 
who knows how to light that smoke artfully and unforgettably. And that, for me, is the problem. I don't want to see anything about the Civil War composed in my own time that is artful and unforgettable. I doubt very seriously that anything in Spielberg's battle scenes can match anyway the simple eyewitness account description of smoke from one survivor of the Battle of the Wilderness. The smoke drifted to and fro, and there were many rifts in it. There were many rifts in it. It's the sort of detail, almost literary, but not quite, that's worth 20 Lincolns to a novelist. There were many rifts in it. It's a kind of anti-rhetoric the near equivalent of the greatest line I have ever read in a war memoir, General Dean's comment in his memoir of the Korean War, that in lifting off from the Korean battleground by helicopter and seeing the fires laid out on the ground at what seemed discrete distances from one another, Korea seemed to him a kind of Pittsburgh. I love that. The novels of the Civil War written by veterans, the novels, for instance, of John W. DeForest and Albion Tourget, are, as it turns out, not a great deal of help in avoiding the rhetoric of history. Their battle scenes are, of course, good. They couldn't help but be. Having actually fought in the historic battles and being very competent writers, DeForest and Tourget aren't about to falsify. But being conventional, popular novelists of their time, they tend to romanticize other aspects of the war. Though DeForest, for instance, is remarkably honest about sex when he's writing about his minor characters, his principles often behave as though they're figures in a mask of courtly love. Is that the way people actually behaved in the 1860s, or is that the tradition of the popular novel? Because I choose to believe the latter, I keep going back to the memoirs, which teach me, the best of them anyway, that war is, among many other aspects, extremely odd, literally odd, full of disjunctions and strangenesses on the battlefield, inexplicable occurrences that act against any effort to render a story tight and comprehensible. The best of the memoirs, to my mind, is a man named Frank Wilkeson. Wilkeson wasn't even 16 years old when he ran away from his father's farm in upstate New York in 1863 to join the Union Army. In 1886, 20 years after the end of the war, he published a book called Recollections of a Private Soldier in the Army of the Potomac. It's going to sound strange that while praising Wilkeson for what's raw and true-seeming in his book, I'm also going to say he's a good writer to go to if you subscribe to what I'll call ungenerously the Julie Harris School of Historical Accuracy. That is, if you want to believe that the sensibility of the Civil War soldier is just like ours. His book is peculiarly modern in the way that the best World War II memoir I know of, E.B. Sledge's With the Old Breed, is modern. And what I mean by modern here is that the writer has no interest in making the case for nobility or for any of the higher impulses in war. Wilkeson is who I quoted before, the guy who wrote the description of battle smoke having rifts in it. And he's capable of beautiful observations, a novelist's observation. He describes General Meade at the start of the fighting around Spotsylvania this way. Meade was nervous, and his hand constantly sought his face, which it stroked. That's lovely. But Wilkeson isn't always so interested in grace notes. In fact, the current reprint of his book by the University of Nebraska Press has given it a new title, Turned Inside Out. What Wilkeson refers to by that phrase, turned inside out, is the pockets of the dead on the battlefield. Those pockets having been picked by those soldiers on their own side who survived the battle and who reckoned that the dead have no use for money or watches or anything else of value that might have been in those pockets. For Wilkeson, the emptied pockets of the dead was the most indelible image of the war. As a novelist, I respond to that detail in the same way I respond to the detail in E.B. Sledge's memoir of the daily grind at Okinawa, 
where Sledge writes about bored GIs taking target practice by aiming at the heads of the penises of Japanese corpses on the ground. They're details that take me out of the rhetoric of history into a strange but understandable human space. They're not the sort of details you're going to find in The Greatest Generation or Saving Private Ryan, and I don't suspect there are many battlefield pickpockets in Lincoln though I think Quentin Tarantino wouldn't think twice about including them in his movies. But as much as my reading Wilkerson leads me to believe that the boundary between us and them is a thin one, I still believe the novelist has to be careful about honoring that boundary. It's dangerously tempting to believe, as Wilkerson suggests, that the soldiers of 1864 were as ignoble as we are, as petty, as self-involved, as removed, from the higher patriotic impulses as so many of us seem to be. But if that's the case, then writing a Civil War novel should be a snap. Simply write it as if it was a Vietnam War novel, minus the drugs, and you will not be far off the mark. But no, I don't think so. And this brings me to the main thing I want to talk about, which is certainly not new, but maybe bears repeating, particularly if you happen to be a novelist attempting to penetrate the truth of another time. That is, that the reliability of nonfiction accounts of any event, whether it's the Battle of the Wilderness or James Fry's uh, drug addiction, is always going to be suspect. Memoir itself is suspect. So are letters. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote some gorgeous letters home from the war. But in them, you can't help but see the image of himself he hoped to present to a posterity he couldn't believe would have no interest in him. We need letters, we need memoirs, if we were to put together anything like a reasonable version of the past. But we also need to keep in mind the question, when, no matter how urgent the effort to be honest, is the shaping hand not present? At a certain point in my research, which I hasten to say goes on, which I remain very much in the midst of, it occurred to me that if I really wanted to understand the mind of a Civil War soldier, or of young men in general in the 1860s, I actually had to move beyond the memoirs and novels of the war. I had to go back to the place where the shaping hand is most present, where it makes no pretense not to be present, where it asks us to see it in its most naked form. That is, to the novels and stories that preceded the war. The novels and stories that had nothing directly to do with the war, the novels and stories, some of them hugely popular, some not, that did what we entrust serious fiction to do. That is to reflect for ourselves the ways in which we construct ourselves. Let me say right off, since I'm about to talk about James Fenimore Cooper and Nathaniel Hawthorne and to a lesser degree Herman Melville, that I'm not fooling myself into believing that the average Union Army officer packed for war with a copy of the Pathfinder in his knapsack. Though some, I'm sure, did, most didn't. Most, in fact, wouldn't have read that book. Which is not to say they wouldn't have found themselves, a fundamental part of themselves, described in it. There's even less of a chance that have read Hawthorne. But it's an important part of what I'm proposing here that I believe that even though the young man who pumped my gas this morning lives in a world, well, has likely never heard of Dennis Johnson or David Foster Wallace, he nevertheless lives in a world whose psychic dimensions have been pretty accurately limbed by those writers. If a novelist in 150 years wants to write a novel about that 2013 gas station attendant, he could do a lot worse than to read Dennis Johnson, the writer who I feel has captured this moment in our collective existence better than anyone else. Herman Melville, I need to say right away, though perhaps the greatest 19th century American novelist, is actually not a good go-to guy for a sense of the inner workings of 1860s men. However detailed, even exhaustively detailed, Moby Dick is, it's not a guide to the way men lived. When Starbuck, arguing with Ahab for the virtues of domestic life, one of my favorite lines says, Wife and child, too, are Starbucks. Wife and child, too, of his brotherly, sisterly, playfellow youth. When I hear Starbuck, Starbucks say that, I tend to write off Herman Melville as a spokesman for common existence. 
Moby Dick and Billy Budd, like the scout toward Aldi, have great penetrative value, but they belong in large part to what I'll call loosely the genre of the romance. Heightened figures doing heightened things in a mostly unreal atmosphere while still managing to convey something profound about existence. The Bible, I would argue, does the same thing. What separates Hawthorne from Melville, in terms of his usefulness to me, has to do with the fact that in his early years as a writer, the important years, he never ventured very far. He hid in his family house in Salem. Then when he married and had to earn money, he went as far as the custom house down the street and then to the old manse 30 or 40, years away, uh, 30 or 40 miles away in Concord. He looked out the window and he brooded. And what he saw when he looked out the window, mostly, was woods. Woods. Astonishing how much of Hawthorne is about the woods, like so much of Grimm. Boys and girls going into the woods, the scary woods, the enchanted woods, the woods that had been endowed with a power and an efficacy that we no longer so easily grant to woods. Not that there isn't still a lot of woods, but I would argue it's not the same woods. It's very important not to be sentimental or nostalgic about this. It's always a danger. There's a wonderful moment in the movie Atlantic City where the old shyster played by Burt Lancaster is waxing nostalgic about the great lost days of Atlantic City. Looking out to sea, he says, the Atlantic City used to be really something in those days. But I know what Burt Lancaster means. He does mean something. So bear with me. Let me wax nostalgic for a moment in hopes of drawing what I think is at bottom not merely nostalgic but true. When I was a boy growing up in a town seven miles west of Boston in the golden age of the 1950s, when your mother was likely to say, go out and play, and blessedly wouldn't care where you went as long as you were home for supper, my brother and I used to take to the woods. And it was nearly always kind of thrilling because they were genuinely spooky. We didn't know what we would find, and because these particular woods were full of water and abandoned, corroded bridges, there was a little bit of survival technique that needed to be learned. But it was more than that, because the woods 50 years ago were still peopled. Once, on a dare in junior high school, a friend and I escaped from the bus line and ran behind the school and into the woods that separated the school building from the nearest housing development, which might have been only three or four miles, but still a space into which no one we knew had ever gone. The experience was terrifying because we came upon dwellings where people lived, only they weren't ordinary recognizable dwellings. And the people who lived in them, we were sure, weren't the sorts of people we were likely to run into at the stop and shop. It was Hansel and Gretel territory. We were certain that if someone came out of those dwellings and saw us, we were goners. There was, at the edge of the known established world, another world. It held secrets. It offered a challenge. A successful encounter with the woods yielded knowledge, not always painless. I'm talking about a common childhood experience of 50 years ago, but I bring it up because that simple experience is my one connection to the sense that Nathaniel Hawthorne gives me of an inhabited world at the edge of civilization, an inhabited world that speaks to the power the woods had for young men in the 19th century. Consider, Hawthorne's young Goodman Brown, newly married, not entirely convinced, though he tells himself that he is, of his wife's virtue, goes into the woods one night to test everything he knows about himself, about his wife, Faith, about the world. On his way in, he encounters all the virtuous people in the town. They're all on their way to the same place where he's going, to a rite. Of course, it's run by witches. Of course, they're all witches. Faith is a witch. All virtue is a deception. This is an admittedly very superficial description of a great story, but even describing it superficially conveys, I hope, to those who haven't read it, something essential to Hawthorne and to what I'm trying as a novelist to enter in the 19th century mind. The knowledge young Goodman Brown gains <clears throat> is not knowledge he could have gained in the city with its masks 
and its customs. He had to go someplace that frightened him. That was what the woods were for. True knowledge required a going in. In another Hawthorne story, my favorite Hawthorne story, Roger Malvin's Burial, a young man is, is returning from fighting in the Indian Wars. He's with an older comrade, Roger Malvin, who's wounded and who doesn't think he's going to be able to make it back. So he says to the young man, go on, let me die here in the woods, but promise me one thing, that you'll come back and bury me. The young man, whose name is Reuben Bourne, is engaged to Roger Malvin's daughter. He's eager to get back, so he agrees to leave his friend. Roger Malvin ties a yellow ribbon to a sapling so that Reuben will be able to find this place when he comes back to bury him. But Reuben doesn't come back. When he gets back to civilization, he's so ashamed of what he did that he can't admit to it. He marries Roger Malvin's daughter. They have a beautiful, beloved son named Cyrus, but nothing goes right for them. Reuben's endeavors all fail, and when Cyrus is an adolescent, they decide to decamp, to move to a new place. They have to go through the woods. One night while they're camping, Reuben decides to go hunting for a deer. But when he shoots his arrow at the flash of life he sees in the woods, of course the arrow hits Cyrus. And when he reaches his son's dead body, he sees above it on a tall tree the yellow ribbon Roger Malvin had tied to mark the spot. If you're to take Hawthorne seriously as I do, you come to the understanding that the founding American story had to do with an errand into the wilderness. And to fail to perform that errand was to seal a man's doom. Errand into the Wilderness is in fact the title of the novel I'm writing. It's the title as well of a sermon delivered in Massachusetts in 1670 by the Reverend Samuel Danforth in which he laid out his philosophy that the American endeavor was going to be different, special, because it was an attempt to work out God's plan not in corrupting civilization but in the wilderness with all its intrinsic sense of challenge and danger. Our early history, Danforth to Hawthorne and beyond, is all about a profound encounter with the woods, about finding out by going in. That philosophy had to lie somewhere in the mind of any educated young man at the start of the Civil War. It's the first of my tasks, then, when I sit down to write this. The first thing that seems essential to confront to absorb the presence of that director in the inner life of my hero, a young man who has been fed much more than I have been fed by the notion of a living, demanding wilderness. To think about what existed for him, literally and metaphorically, in the packed woods at the edge of the settlement. To think about that is to fight the too easy identification possible to all of us when we read, for instance, a memoir like Frank Wilson, that suggests separates young men now from young men then. In fact, a vastness separates us. And though it might seem the most trivial of ways to confront that vastness, I choose to begin by thinking about the difference in what we each see. A young man in 1862 and a much older man in 2013. What we see, and just as important, how we think about what we see when we each look out the window. I decided early on that the hero of my novel, who I've decided to name very unoriginally Adam, was going to be a student at Harvard Law at the beginning of the Civil War. So naturally, I went and did some research at Harvard. There's a room in the bowels of Harvard called the Map Room. It's literally what it says it is. It's more like a warren of rooms containing maps. And when you look at maps of Cambridge in the 1860s, what you come upon is a city that looks sort of frail sort of incomplete. Lots was happening. Buildings were going up. There were new horse trolleys to take the students from Cambridge over to Boston. But to look at those, those maps is to see how all this activity was going on in a very small space, surrounded, encroached on, almost swallowed by woods. If you didn't fight them back, they would swallow you. All the activity that was to lead to the Cambridge that emerged at the end of the 19th century was happening in the context of woods. 
One of the first ways of confronting what I referred to as the vastness separating me and my Adam is to think of the meaning of that phrase, the context of woods. Last week, as I was writing this presentation, I found myself staring out the window from a desk in the library at Smith College, where I'm currently teaching. Smith, like the University of Rochester, was built according to a certain plan, a grid consisting of class buildings and quads with lots of trees, grassy areas with benches, a kind of gentle absorption of nature into the plan of an institution whose objective we might call the opposite of nature. Beyond the campus of Smith lies the city of Northampton and then Amherst, a very civilized little pocket of the world. But we are surrounded, we're in the foothills of the Berkshires, so we're surrounded by trees. More trees, more woods, possibly than Harvard was surrounded by in the 1860s. But if Harvard then could be said to exist in the context of woods, then the woods that surround me at Smith College seem to exist within the context of Smith. They're there, in other words, because we, the civilized world represented by Smith, allow them to be. Our battle for dominance over the woods has been, in some obvious ways, won, at least very recently we've thought so. What's there is there because we have not built on it, have chosen not to build on it. Though climate change and the storms that come with climate change may make that dominance seem elusive, nonetheless we, most of us in our daily lives, do not think of the woods as a threat. I do not construct my daily existence thinking about or worrying about what might happen if I go into the woods. Instead, I walk in them on marked trails. I ski on them on groom trails. And it's possible on some level to think of them as there for me, just as the trees on a college campus are there for us. It's an illusion, but it's an illusion we harbor, an illusion we've grown used to. I've always been struck by the fact that Arnold Toynbee, British historian, began his multi-volumed A Study of History by looking at a village called Town Hill, Connecticut. I forget now when Town Hill was founded, but at the time when Toynbee was writing, he published his first volume in the 1930s, the town was already in ruins. The former center was overgrown with forest growth. It had been abandoned, the fight to protect it given up. And Toynbee used the image of an attacking, invasive forest to make the great point he wanted to make about all civilizations. They rise and fall based on maintenance, on how much we fight, how much we worry, and never cease worrying about what wants to take us over, to creep and grow and consume us. It may be, it probably is, a huge stretch to impose the philosophy of a controversial British historian on the mind and emotions of a young man at Harvard on the onset of the Civil War. But again, it seems useful to me to think in these terms because I am trying to bridge a gap between one world and another. One world, my world, where the woods are considered safe, even tamed, and a world where they had a force of their own, both literal and psychological. Part of that psychological force had to be an uncertainty about whether our errand into the wilderness was going to be successful. Samuel Danforth in 1670 had made it very clear that this wasn't a battle we had any guarantee of winning. A century later, when Benjamin Franklin was asked what had been achieved by the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, he famously answered, a republic, if you can keep it. A hundred years after that came the question, very real, of whether we were going to be able to keep it. And what did we have to do to keep it? The suggestion made by the Civil War was that in order to keep it, we had to go into the woods and shoot at our brothers. Was that our errand into the wilderness? Was that how the prize was going to be won? And there was one further complication because our ideas about the woods contained a contradiction that we've still not fully resolved. I'm going to end by talking briefly about the writer I've saved for last, James Fenimore Cooper. I've saved him for last because in certain ways, for my purposes anyway, he's the most important 19th century writer. If Melville gives us the big picture, 19th century man and his huge questions of what our exact place was, if Hawthorne brilliantly limbed what Perry Miller called 
the New England mind with its guilt and its striving for sexual freedom, those how dare we questions people, how dare we risk questions people, people posed in tiny clearings hacked out of the Massachusetts woods. Then Cooper, though not as profound a writer as either Melville or Hawthorne, ventured in his own way deeper into the dream life of 19th century men. He was the poet of what we didn't want to lose. And what we didn't want to lose existed in the heart of the thing we had to fight and fight hard if we were going to have any kind of civilization, the woods. Cooper wrote about the great contradiction at the heart of the 19th century, at least the dream life of the 19th century. We had to fight against the Indian, and at the same time we had to revere him. We had to build a civilization while at the same time understanding that we were purest and truest when we were farthest from civilization. We hadn't chosen our errand into the wilderness accidentally. The woods, the enemy of frail civilizations like Town Hill, Connecticut, were also our measure. Our test was not who we could be when we were in an office building or even when we were praying in a cathedral. Our test was in who we became, how true, how pure we could remain in the wilderness. These are ideas that, as we know, have never died in America. Periodically, they rise up, as they did in the 60s and 70s in the Back to the Land movement, and then again 20 years later in the Wilding movement that came out of Robert Bly's book, Iron John. But in both of these more recent iterations of the myth of return, the woods are benevolent. They are there for us to harvest or to run naked in. They hold in them nothing threatening, only our liberation. We would make a great mistake, those of us who are novelists trying to penetrate the past, if we believe that the impulses of the 1960s and the 1990s make us just like those who entertained similar impulses in the past. What Cooper knew the thing that lies underneath his rhapsodic descriptions of glimmer glass and the surrounding greenery is that the woods in the 19th century did not exist for a restorative, liberating purpose, but to offer us that contest we wouldn't necessarily win, but which would, as Samuel Danforth knew, as young Goodman Brown knew, as Reuben Bourne of Roger Melvin's burial knew, define us forever. Are these the questions a young man from the Harvard Law School would have carried into the Civil War? I can't be sure. I can't. They are ideas I find it helpful to think about, that's all, as I try to imagine my way into the year 1862. I am taking the best of what was there in the culture leading up to the war and using it. My job is thankfully intellectually a good bit simpler, though in certain other ways much more difficult, than the critics. My job as a novelist is to pay attention to the way someone enters a room or a forest, to pay attention to what he sees and what he says when he does that, to his perceptions, the tone of his voice, the light surrounding things. The things that make for life in a novel are the things that are seen and the things that happen. But underneath all that, and basically unspoken is something else, something that while we write, we are thinking about while not saying. The tone of a world, the assumptions of a world, the effort, and I have to admit the fun, of trying to write inside a historical moment not my own, is to ask these questions, to probe these questions, and to allow that internal probing to affect what I'm writing, to remember at every moment that the world my hero sees is not the world I see. To the achievement of that goal, the first step right now is to begin with the woods, to enter Adam's wilderness and to see where the errand takes me. Thank you. <laughs>